Hi, my name is Travis McVeigh. I'm an anesthesiologist from Dallas, Texas. I host a podcast called Thank You Notes at Ars Longa Media. Showing gratitude to people just makes me feel good, and I want to share the practice of thank you notes with everybody who listens. I write thank you notes to people and then bring them on the show to read it to them. Past guests have included my high school teachers, my friends, other physicians, and a couple of internet celebrities. I will also be doing episodes that explore the science behind gratitude practices to demonstrate to everybody the actual tangible benefits of practicing gratitude. Listen everywhere you get podcasts and check out the extras on my social media accounts. Thank you for listening. Support for the Study Smarter series and the following message come from StatMed Learning. We're trying something new with this year's Step 1 series. We'll be featuring snippets of advice sponsored by various companies. And this week and throughout the series, we'll be featuring Ryan Orwig from StatMed Learning, who will come on the show to discuss various test-taking problems and to offer some practical advice on test-taking strategy. So stay tuned to the middle of the episode here or go to the statprogram.com to learn more about what StatMed Learning can do for your board preparation. Welcome to the Inside the Boards podcast, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn to think like a question writer so you can study smarter, not harder, and succeed in medical school. And now here's your host, Patrick Beeman. Welcome to the 2018 Inside the Boards Study Smarter series for the USMLE Step 1 and Comlex Level 1. I am your host, Patrick Beeman. This series launches today and will run until the end of June. We'll be providing you high-yield, high-quality, free open access medical education so you can study on the go and redeem some of the time you would lose cleaning, brushing your teeth, showering, exercising to help you really focus in during this important consolidation period of your first two years of medical education. You can listen to the 2017 Study Smarter series, which eventually we will be moving over to this channel over on the main Inside the Boards channel. We would ask, if you like what we're doing with this show, please, please leave us a five-star rating on iTunes and a review of the show so we can get to the top of the charts in iTunes. As well, head over to InsideTheBoards.com, click on the Support ITB button and you can learn how you can financially support ITB and if you choose to do so we are offering an ad-free version of the 2017 study smarter series which you can read more about on that web page and don't forget about ITB's all audio QBank. go to our website or go to insidetheboards.podbean.com get a three-month subscription if you sign up for that we'll give you an extra month free until April 1st. In this episode, we are launching with a discussion between Stuart Bryant, our producer extraordinaire, and Greg Rodden, host of the Med School Fizz podcast. Well worth you checking out, especially during your dedicated board prep time. But they are, in this episode, going to be discussing some cardiovascular physiology questions from the Open Osmosis platform. Thank you for listening. We're honored to be part of your board preparation journey. Good luck, happy studying, and if you have any questions or ideas on how we can help you, send us an email to podcast at insidetheboards.com. Before we launch into the main content of today's episode, here is our first StatMed lesson with Ryan Orwig from thestatprogram.com, StatMed Learning. Ryan, why are some people bad test takers? I think there are multiple reasons that we might meet these people who are truly bad test takers, but one of them is has to do with working memory. So I think issues with working memory, that's one of the more common problems uh, at the heart of bad test taking when we're talking about USMLE and complex uh, test takers. So board style questions require a ton 
of working memory capacity, very burdensome on that working memory, sometimes called short term memory, uh, lasts like 30 seconds ish. And it's like a mental chalkboard where we work out problems and it has a limited capacity. That capacity is thought to be seven plus or minus two. So the average person maybe holds on to seven items. Uh, with most med students, they're going to be on the high end of that working memory spectrum, holding on to nine, maybe 10 or 11 pieces of information at a time. That's really important when they're in the middle of a, of a given USMLE or Comlux style question. So, so here's my big theory on this. Uh, I think the conventional wisdom on this is the higher the IQ, uh, the higher the working memory. Now, therefore, most med students, high IQs are going to have high working memories. So I think like the way the NBME and all of these governing bodies have sort of, uh, you know, are just the way they've evolved over the last 20, 30 years is with this blind expectation of robust working memories in the people who are being tested. So if you have a robust working memory, you're fine. But what if you don't have a robust working memory? What if you have an average working memory of seven and you hold on seven pieces and the person next to you can hold on to 11? It's going to make working these questions harder, specifically because you are losing key clues or essential thoughts while working the questions. So the most cartoonish way I can illustrate this is if I asked you like a simple question like, hey, what's 10 plus 10? And you say, well, that's 20. And I'm arguing with you saying, no, 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 it's 22. And we're back and forth on this 20, 22, 20, 22. And finally, I say, wait, what's 10 plus 10 plus two? And you're like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, that's definitely 22. I, I didn't hear you say plus two. That's what a lot of our people are experiencing they're like wait i thought this was the answer then you go back and you're like look the appetite decreased you're like oh yeah i, I totally didn't see that clue and so you're trying to do this equation without all of the clues it's really hard to get answers right that way right so some people's brains just work this way i mean if you have adhd your brain is definitely limited in its working capacity working memory capacity i mean if you have reading issues uh under stress under anxiety you can limit your brain's ability to sort of use all of the, these slots. So, so how can we address this? The StatMed Board's workshop teaches a very specific rigid system. It's not, not the only way to do questions, but it's a way for people who really want to limit the burden on that working memory so that they can train in a way that's going to limit the burden so that they can execute and show what they know on test day. To learn more, go to thestatprogram.com and stay tuned to the rest of the Study Smarter series for a special offer from Ryan and StatMed Learning. And let us know if you liked these sorts of snippets. Uh, in future Study Smarter series episodes, we'll be kind of putting these right in the middle of the content, but I kind of wanted to feature this here so that everybody hears it and will please provide us feedback on whether or not you like it. You can send Ryan an email to ryan at thestatprogram.com or you can send us one to podcast at insidetheboards.com. Without further ado, here are Stuart and Greg from the Med School Fizz podcast with a little cardiovascular learning for your on-the-go study pleasure. Enjoy. Just to get us started off here, a 64-year-old a Caucasian male undergoes cardiac bypass surgery without any complications. You want to wean this patient from bypass. For a standard weaning procedure, it would not be necessary to obtain which of the following to calculate systemic vascular resistance. Is it A, the mean arterial pressure, B, the cardiac output, C, the right atrial pressure or central venous pressure, or D, the mean filling pressure. Tell me what the answer here is, Greg. So, I believe that the answer is D, mean filling pressure. And this is one of those questions where you kind of just need to know what the equation is, <laughs> unfortunately. So let's, let's get into it. So systemic vascular resistance uh, can be calculated by uh, first subtracting the right atrial pressure from the mean arterial pressure and dividing by cardiac output, uh, and then multiplying by 80. <laughs> <laughs> That's very, very exciting. I, I think the 80 just gets it into the right units that you need, like the dynes per something, something. 
for systemic vascular resistance, like this is the thing you need to know is this equation. And there's really no other way around knowing that uh, it's the mean arterial pressure and you need the central venous pressure or the right atrial pressure, which they should be equivalent or fairly close. And then you want the cardiac output, which if on the exam, you're probably not going to be given the cardiac output or maybe even the mean arterial pressure, uh, but they will give you the number so you can calculate those. Right. The easy thing, I guess, is cardiac output. That's uh, heart rate times stroke volume, right? Correct. And then the other one is the mean arterial pressure. And I always forget it. Yeah. <laughs> so do you, do you have it off the top of your head? Uh, yeah. So mean arterial pressure, I believe, should be two-thirds uh, diastolic plus one-third systolic. It, it usually somewhere runs somewhere between like 70 and, and 100 or 70 and 110 mm -hmm. or so. Uh, and I guess one kind of useful point to point out about mean arterial pressure, so two, thir two thirds diastolic because most of the time the heart is in diastole. Right. That's kind of a, kind of a helpful point there. Yeah. And, and those, that's just the average of the pressures over the time. And that works out to be, since you spend more time in diastole, it's going to get the more weight in this equation, right? There we go. Trying to think if there's anything else I really want to cover with this. Let me just add my little hack here for yeah. thoroughness, I guess. So on the exam, they're going to give you all these numbers and they're going to throw more numbers than you need just because they want you to know which ones you had to pick, right? Right. I think the only number here that is just a number that they will give to you is going to be your right atrial pressure. And that could be your central venous pressure also. So those are two things that are they're basically close enough to be synonymous. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that's at least how I understand, you know, at the right atrium, that's basically the returning pressure from the rest of the body. So that's going to be equivalent to your central venous pressure. Now, if they're giving yeah. you all these other, like your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure or your left atrial pressure, uh, you should know that those are all pretty low numbers, right? Uh, I don't know if you have them remembered off the top of your head, but I'm pretty sure they're generally, uh, if there is, if it's in diastole, it's going to be probably be, you know, less than 10, right? Yeah, I believe that's correct. Uh, I, I think the right atrium is you know, one to eight. The right ventricle in diastole will probably be about the same. And then it, it goes up to maybe 30. The pulmonary artery is a tiny bit higher. And the left atrium is, you know, probably less than 10. And this is assuming that everything is normal in the heart. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the point, I, I'm, I'm bringing up all these numbers, not because I'm saying you need to remember them for the test, but because they are all fairly low and similar, they are not going to have this marked, they're, they're not going to massively change systemic vascular resistance. So my point is that you can kind of interchange a lot of these numbers. Uh, if there's a num if there's a pressure that's pretty much under 10 on the exam, you might be able to swap that in for your right atrial pressure. Now it's just better if you know that you need the right atrial pressure altogether, but uh, if you're not sure which number to use and the answer choices are not all very specific and similar. Uh, you might be able to get away with swapping out one of these uh, pressures. Make sense? Yeah, I think, I think that makes sense. Yeah, I, I get that. That's uh, you, you. You either know it or you don't, and it's kind of hard to really fudge your way through this equation. Unfortunately, there's some medicine you just have to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Yeah, and then the the last part of this. Uh, so, so while the question asks, you know, which, which part, uh, or what information do you need to calculate systemic vascular resistance? And we mentioned mean, mean arterial pressure, right atrial pressure and cardiac output. 
the question also incorporates, you know, what is mean filling pressure? Um, so, so we ought to, we ought to cover that. Uh, mean filling pressure is the pressure that would exist at zero cardiac output due to distension within the circulatory system. If the heart stops, there is no pressure difference between the arterial and venous sides. And the basal pressure that remains is the mean filling pressure. So when the heart starts pumping again, it will have an end diastolic pressure equal to the mean filling pressure. So when the heart stops and there's no pressure differential between the right and the left sides or between the arterial and the venous system, the pressure that remains, the pressure that's exerted on the vessels by the, by the volume or the, the blood that's in the vessels is the mean filling pressure. And so I think that okay that might help to to close out the uh, yeah the conversation and, and that's just what's left over right you know they, you have yeah, you have exactly. something as long as there is the presence of a fluid in this system it's going to have a basal pressure and yeah. uh, that's our mean filling pressure and that's completely irrelevant for calculating our mean of systemic vascular resistance, but it's good to know for sure. All right, let's give this one a shot then. So a 27 year old man is involved in a motor vehicle accident and sustains massive blood loss. Paramedics report an initial blood pressure of 110 over 65. What anatomical structures are involved in the afferent pathway of the physiologic response to maintain this patient's blood pressure? Is it A, the aortic arch transmitting via the vagus nerve to the midbrain? B, the carotid body transmitting via the glossopharyngeal nerve to the medulla? C, the carotid sinus transmitting via the glossopharyngeal nerve to the medulla? Or D, the carotid sinus transmitting via the vagus nerve to the medulla? All right. What do we think the answer here is? All right. And the correct answer is C. The carotid sinus transmits by the glossopharyngeal nerve to the medulla. Um, so this one is, uh, it, it kind of wants you to make the distinction between the sinuses and the, uh, and the body, or the, the carotid sinus and the carotid body, and what information is carried by both of them, yeah. Or what? What information? What information is collected at each site and then transmitted back to the brain, and what cranial nerve is associated with uh, with each? And where does it go? Jesus. So uh, yeah. it, it's a bit of a doozy to keep all of this straight. And I know for one that I never can seem to keep this straight. So yeah. do you have any way to put this together in your head? I, I don't have I don't have a great um, mnemonic or anything for this one, but the so the carotid sinus uh, carry it carries uh, baroreceptor information. Unfortunately, I I just I remember it because I've gotten so many questions wrong about it. <laughs> <laughs> I took a a, a bio inorganic chemistry class in college, and they would say something to the effect of. Uh, it's what what we're doing is bio and organic chemistry, so it can't be simple. So it's opposite. <laughs> it can't be simple, so it's opposite. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, and that sort of applies here to medicine, where you can't just be like body baroreceptor done. Yeah, yeah. And I think the easiest way for me to remember it is uh, what you know, thinking about what a sinus is. If you if you have a sinus, that's like an expanded space. Uh, and I can kind of think of that with like your, the, the sinuses in your head are like these spaces. And, and that's exactly what kind of the carotid sinus is. It's just this expansion in the carotid artery that allows for sensation of the baroreceptor. And if you know that, you can know that the carotid body which to me is so similar because it's it's right there. And in my first year, I, th I thought that these things were too similar to really be making any distinctions about. But the body is like a little, it's like a little ganglion of uh, chemoreceptors that is sensing mm -hmm. uh, for the O2, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and just understanding that the body is 
this little thing sitting outside the uh, the artery that's sensing the levels of oxygen and CO2, and you know that gets you that chemoreceptor ability. That's a little hard, and you may need to look up a diagram of it to to have a good idea of the difference between the body or the carotid sinus, unless you have just this mastery of anatomy that I'd no longer have. But it, it, the next part of this question, it, you know, that's not enough to get you this question, right? <laughs> you right. you need to know what else goes on here. Like, how does this get transferred back to the brain? Yeah. So the yeah. So the next the next uh, component of it is uh, asking. All right, is it the uh, vagus nerve or is it the glossopharyngeal nerve that is carrying? Um, this information back to back to the brain or the, the an afferent component of the uh, vagus nerve or, or glossopharyngeal nerve yeah um, so in the context of this question the vagus nerve is traveling all the way down to the aortic arch and and much further than that uh, while the uh, glossopharyngeal nerve um, is traveling to yes it's traveling to the glossa or the tongue, um, but also to the pharynx and the carotid artery and the, and the carotid sinus are all circa the, the pharynx or larynx in, in this case. Uh, yeah, that's, that's basically how, how I remember it is remembering that vagus nerve goes much further than, uh, than the glossopharyngeal nerve is going to aortic arch is significantly, uh, further down or more distal, uh, right. relative to uh, to where the cranial nerves are and that's uh, originating from in, in the brain and, and that's pretty much what you need to know to to get this uh, you know for me I always wanted to you know basic science teaching kind of does you a disservice here because there is a tiny little bit of vagal uh, sensory going to these uh, structures and but the predominance is the glossopharyngeal nerve to my understanding right and when right. they teach you yeah. that it's both and then you get a question and it's one or the other uh that kind of hurts you because you're sitting you're stuck here trying to figure out which one it is more of yeah yeah and and just in in general in general with the boards like you kind of just want to make those those hard and fast distinctions <laughs> exactly. like otherwise otherwise you will just you'll be shooting yourself in the foot. <laughs> right. It, it, like the nuances, it, it, as important as they might be in the real world on the board exam, right. uh, they really can't have those for uh, well done questions, you know, multiple answer choices being right, then it's just not a good question anymore. Yeah. And then the last part here is that, you know, your respiratory centers are located in the mandola, not the midbrain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, and another another good uh, good memory tool to have, um, especially when when taking your your board exams. But I mean, in, for for real life too, uh, is knowing where where the cranial nerves are relative to the brainstem um, structures. Mm -hmm. So so I, I think about everything relative to the pons. DIT has this has this great mnemonic, and I don't know if they came up with it or whatever, but they presented it to me. Uh, where they they say uh, five, six, seven, eight is the pons pons um, for like cheerleader pom poms, <laughs> and so cranial cranial nerves five, six, seven, and eight are located in the pons. Uh, cranial nerves one through four are located above the pons um, or in the midbrain. Or I guess three, three and four are in the midbrain, and then the other ones are above the pons, and then below the pons in the medulla, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Right. Um, uh, so if you remember that the pons is the pons, pons uh, five, six, seven, eight, then uh, then you'll be you'll be good to go. That's awesome. Yeah, and and then that that helps you to answer the rest of this question. Uh, because it's it's basically saying our right, glossopharyngeal nerve is cranial nerve nine, and so where is cranial nerve nine going to go back to? Where where are its cell bodies, um, and they are located in the in the medulla. I like that memory tool. Stay tuned for part two of this discussion on the Inside the Boards Study Smarter series, 
And please share this with your friends. Share this on social media. Leave us a rating and a review on iTunes inside the boards community. Let's get this show to the top of the charts so that we can stand out and help more students study on the go and redeem some of their own time. Thanks for listening. And thanks to James from Two O'Clock Courage for letting us use the opening track, which is The Valentine Blast Furnace off 2016's album Miss Alette. You can check Two O'Clock Courage, the best band you've never heard of, at twoo'clockcourage.com or on iTunes or Spotify. Inside the Boards is in no way affiliated with the United States Medical Licensing Examination, Comprehensive Osteopathic Medical License Examination, National Board of Medical Examiners, the National Council of State Boards of Nursing, National Board of Osteopathic Medical Examiners, or any other licensing or examination body. All exam names and other trademarks are the property of the respective trademark owners. Content discussed during the program is the property of Inside the Boards, or the attributed trademark owner and may not be reproduced without permission from the appropriate entity. Inside the Boards fully adheres to the respective policies on irregular behavior outlined by the aforementioned credentialing bodies.